headed into 2024, we learned that the prodigal son had entered the transfer portal. But now the question is, will the prodigal son return home to Raleigh? You are locked on Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Wolfpack Nation? It's time to get locked in with Locked On. Thanks for making Locked On Wolfpack your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Our first episode of 2024 is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 back in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's right, 150 bucks if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Happy Tuesday to all. Happy 2024. Happy New Year. We are back in the saddle. Took a couple of days to digest what we saw down in Orlando. We're, we're recharged. We're ready to get back at it here. Happy New Year. As always, I'm Grayson Boone, joined by former Wolfpack defensive tackle Kenton Gibbs. And Kenton, as I mentioned there in the open, the prodigal son has entered the transfer portal on New Year's Eve. Of course, I am referring to wide receiver Noah Rogers. He's a local Raleigh kid who took his talents up to Columbus for his freshman year of college. Did not get any run for the Buckeyes in 2023, including any snaps in their bowl game and has subsequently now entered the portal what are the chances that he's coming back to run with the wolf pack? The chances are great. And no, I want to say this to you, brother. You want 80? We got it. You want five? We got it. You want 85? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Whatever number you want, brother, you name it, they got it for you. But it's a great chance that uh, NC State lands the young man. I mean, Wesley Grimes is his best friend after all. And, and you know, I've, I'm hearing rumblings and whisperings that he's already followed Grayson McCall and whatnot on social media. So, you know, and I, I also heard that a large part of why there seemed to be a receiver exodus out of Ohio State was because of the quarterback situation, the uncertainty there. And let's just be honest, with all due respect, and I know that this is strange to say about a program that's, you know, looking at, I believe they have, what, 11 wins this year, uh, 11 and two, was it? I mean, they're a program that is, objectively speaking, on a descent instead of ascension. And so, you know, this is a situation where Noah's looking for a home. He's looking for a place to be and all that. And, and from what I heard, it was down to NC State and Ohio State in his recruitment last time around. Well, I'm going to tell you what. OK, they said it on 227. No place like home. When your family's around you, you're never alone. Come on. Come on. Don't, uh, stop playing. Stop playing, no. Let's get on the phone. Wes, get on the phone. Group FaceTime it out. And don't you hang up that phone until you get a commitment from Mr. Rogers. And that has sort of been the theme of a couple other commitments of late. You have Tamarcus Cooley was actually one time committed to the Wolfpack for decommitting and going up to Maryland. He has now found his way back home. You have, well, a potential Hollywood smother still waiting on official word there. Still looks like. He will be returning back to the state of North Carolina. Wesley Grimes is another one very close to picking the pack. Picked Wake Forest. I believe even in his commitment post said better late than never. He is now running with NC State. And it feels like another massive one here in Noah Rogers. And we have kind of hinted at this for a couple of weeks. We've nudged at it saying, what if he were to enter the portal? Could this be a possibility? And lo and behold, the bomb goes off on New Year's Eve that he does, in fact, enter the portal. I did see that Corey Smith of Pack Pride has already tossed in a crystal ball for Noah Rogers to run with the pack. I think this makes all the sense in the world. I mean, you have a guy who literally grew up here in Raleigh. He's got multiple yeah. high school teammates on the NC State Wolfpack football team. I've said this multiple times this year. These guys that ended up picking another school and then they turn around and they see what KC did in just his freshman season here in Raleigh. And it kind of signifies, hey, I could do that too. We could all 
kind of come in and really be something uh, here at NC State. So this makes a ton of sense. You got Wesley Grimes, who was his high school best friend. You got Tamarcus Cooley, who's good friends with him. KC, who's good friends with him. Lex Thomas is good friends with him. Like you mentioned, jump on that group FaceTime and don't hang up until you have persuaded him that this is the place to be. Hop on there. Pick up the phone, baby. I know you're home, baby. Okay? Like, let's d- d- get on. Make it happen. No, but in all seriousness, he is important because you need diversity in your receiver room. You need multiple different types of guys. And, of course, you know, you're never going to turn down – if you could get four Randy Mosses or whatever, right? Like, of course, there are those anomalies in the world. If you get four Tory Holtz, you're never going to say, no, I need a 6'5 guy. But you do need multiple different types of players in your receiver room to make things uh, to make things make sense and, and make defenses have to defend every part of the field, right? You can have a – if you only have Casey's and Paylor's on your, on your field, you're going to run into, into some problems – in terms of, hey, we're they're jamming up everything um, underneath. They're you know they're sitting really tough. We're in the red zone. If only we had somebody that we could just kind of say, hey, I'm gonna throw the ball up to you, you versus him. Can you go get it? And with all due respect to Casey and Payler, I think they're fine receivers. I think that I think that uh, Casey has shown us one of the best that we've ever seen in in terms of freshmen running with the pack and all that. One of the best we've ever seen. But with that being said. The reality is simple. It is about having multiple different kinds of guys. You look at how you could use a Noah Rogers. You look at the ways in which you could say, hey, you're going to be not only a jump ball guy, but in terms of blocking on those uh, bubble screens and whatnot, you need a you generally need a bigger guy to do that. And, and not only a bigger guy, a guy that's willing to do those types of things. And I think that that's, that's something that Noah Rogers could definitely add value to the offense here. Yeah, his type of game is not exactly something we have here at NC State, and that makes him such an attractive uh, candidate to chase after in the transfer portal. You mentioned his ability to high point a football, to go up and just get it, snatch it out of the air, is unmatched. His athleticism is off the charts. His route running, his speed after the catch, his ability to make a defender miss, none of this is anything like we've seen here at NC State before, and so – that's why I kind of refer to him as the prodigal son. This would be such a massive addition to this team in 2024. And you talk about having diversity amongst your wide receivers. Yeah, KC and Paler are kind of their own little, uh, they're like a hybrid in, in that they they can line up in the backfield wherever you need them to. They can line up in the slot wherever you need them to. They don't play so much on the outside, but they're incredible athletes in the way that they can. Noah Rogers is a deep ball threat. He's a a, a deep post threat. He is a prototypical number one wide receiver type guy. And that would be such a massive weapon to get in 2024 for Grayson McCall. And you line that up on the other side with potentially a Wesley Grimes. Suddenly NC State has a wealth of wide receivers after being so thin in 2023. And it's a great problem to have. You want as many spectacular athletes as you can get onto one roster, especially when you're trying to get to a very specific place at the end of 2024. Absolutely. And and the reality is, again, we've talked at nauseum about all the things that Noah Rogers can do and all that. But I think on top of the, the different types of receivers you want, you always, you can't have enough game breakers. No, you just can't have enough. You look back at Kansas city's offense when they had Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey and McCole Hardman. And you're like, man, they compounded and built on top of each other in terms of, okay, you got to watch everything deep with, with Hill. Oh, well, you watch everything deep with Hill, and then underneath, you got Kelsey going off. Oh, you try to watch those two, and then all of a sudden, Harvin's going to get up against your third or fourth best cover guy, and he's going to get off. That is the type of situation you want to create here. A pick your poison, because whatever you pick, wherever you pick, we're going to have a mismatch and let Anai cook because he will find it and he will exploit. Noah Rogers would be another spice to the Anai Kitchen Collection. And again, something like you have never smelled before could be on the menu in 2024. But last thing I want to mention here in this Noah Rogers sweepstakes is that the transfer portal window closes today, January 2nd, meaning that if you do not enter your name in the portal, you cannot do it until the spring window. Spring classes for NC State begin next week. I believe it is next Monday. 
So I would anticipate that this thing could move pretty quickly. And I think you could see another domino and potentially some others to happen in the same week as well. So just when you thought you've had enough fun and all the 2024 additions out of the transfer portal before Christmas, we might just be getting some late Christmas gifts as well. You know, this is, again, these are two high quality players that by all accounts, stars, playmakers in the making, just waiting in the wings here. And again, I want to have the problem of we've got too many playmakers and only one ball to go over. I'd love to have that problem. I'd love to have that problem. And because the, the inverse of that is what? Well, we've only got one guy and defenses are going to key him. They're going to stare him down. They're going, hey, we're going to put a spy on him. Whatever our, whatever our protection is, or not protection, whatever our defensive call is, we're going to drag our best corner. You need to follow that guy. We're going to drag our best safety. Wherever he goes, you stay with him. If he goes to the bathroom, you need to be shaking it for him. That is that that's not something you want. That's not something that you want defenses to have the ability to do. Up next, we're going to wrap up our bowl game recap. As you all saw that we got rudely interrupted uh, back on Thursday night. So stick with us after a quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today's show is FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $150 back in bonus bets guaranteed when you place just a $5 bet. That's right, $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is super easy to use, and there's so many different ways to bet, including live same-game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays, and more. You may even want to put some money on the national championship game coming up next Monday. Should be one heck of a game on Monday night. So get over to FanDuel and continue winning. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Maybe even some basketball plays for you. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Time for a little bit of reiteration from our live stream back on Thursday night after the bowl loss to Kansas State down in Orlando. As many of you saw, we did get cut off uh, mid-live stream, so didn't get a chance to get out all of our thoughts. But in a in an effort to kind of summarize here, we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then just a little bit, we'll be giving our big picture takeaways from the bowl game and how that relates, or how that projects, I should say, into 2024. So. Kenton, if you want to start here, give me what you thought was good in this bowl game. I thought that Anai really tried to get creative with the play calling, and he schemed up multiple moments of guys being open. Um, I just think that they weren't the first or second read, or, or Brendan didn't have the time to get to the read. But I thought that Anai's play calling, after rewatching the game, it was better than I had originally uh, thought that it was. It just the execution was not there, but the play calling in and of itself, I mean, he, you know, Anai did a a fair, a pretty good job there. Yeah, he did. He he. You saw some of the similar effort you saw in those last five weeks where we had a five game win streak. In that, the effort to get KC the ball was there. The effort to get creative on the ground using Armstrong was there. And of course, you you saw a lot of success for Armstrong. I believe that was his highest rush total. Uh, for the entire season as he went over 100 yards. I agree in that Anai did do a lot of things that found success using the pieces that we still had here. And, you know, Brennan Armstrong, another part of the good here, he gave it his all, and you knew that he would. And, you know, proud of the guy, but all in all, the entire effort was just simply not enough. Now talk to me about the bad. What were some of the things that were really concerning to you in this loss in the Pop-Tarts Bowl? Our inability to keep contain on a mobile quarterback and the reason that i say our inability to keep contained on a mobile quarterback was problematic to me is because we have multiple uh mobile quarterbacks coming up next year like this is not something where it's like oh yeah this is a a one-off deal and and you know quarterbacks who can move are the exception baby this ain't 1990 football this ain't early 2000 football where you know you're you're gonna see a lot of quarterbacks dropping back and everybody just trying to out pro style all the other teams the new nature of the beast everybody's quarterback has some wheels everybody's quarterback is is you know going to be kind of mobile and for us to have a guy and for us to be going against a guy in Avery Johnson that struggled mightily when you asked him 
throw the ball beyond 10 yards past the line of scrimmage and hit a hit a window for us to have that situation for us to bring in perfect blitzes for us to perfectly you know tony gibson calls a perfect corner blitz it's a it's a cat blitz some people like to call it short side cornerback is blitzing boom for the wide side defensive end to not realize oh if the blitz works perfectly he'll roll out this way and for for that defender to not get their tail outside and force him to make multiple people miss it, it and you know multiple other plays where it was a very similar situation of just uh johnson having way too much time to scramble the reality is if us two can see and say hey if you stop johnson on the ground you will win the game and for that to not get done not only did it not get done the fashion in which it didn't get done where again there were multiple perfectly called blitzes our ability to keep contained was shoddy at best that was bad. Coming into this game, like we laid out with Kenton's keys and some of the previous uh, you know, insight into what K-State was likely going to look to do, you knew that Avery Johnson had the ability to keep a play alive, to scramble out of the pocket, and just make something out of nothing. And that had to be the most imperative thing you had to shut down to give yourself a shot against K-State. And you saw in that fourth quarter, especially, just time after time after time, he was able to escape find the open man, scramble to get 10 yards, extend a drive, and you just saw a slow, painful death for the NC State defense. I thought they did a fairly decent job for the majority of the game outside of, I believe it was that one touchdown run that he had as well, but it just simply wasn't good enough. You had to absolutely force him to beat you through the air because I believe I was saying this when we got cut off on Thursday. I wasn't overly impressed by anything he was doing through the air. I thought we covered pretty well. I thought Aiden White nearly had a pick or two. I think Sean Brown almost had one as well. The The secondary did their job. It's just that we had to contain him long enough to be able to make a play on him, to sack him. He did actually throw away quite a few, but yeah. just didn't quite make enough plays to get to him and make a true difference. He was able to run around, keep plays alive. A couple of the third and longs, third and mediums, even some fourth downs that they were able to keep alive, just backbreakers over and over and over again. So that was tough to watch. And this was the game, I believe I said this as well, you really felt the absence of Peyton Wilson in this one. And I know it's easy to sit here and say, well, well, if we had Peyton, that game goes differently. Well, fact of the matter is we didn't have Peyton and everyone else couldn't quite replicate the difference that he makes. And so the defense just wasn't able to get the job done. That's really all there is to it. You know, they had multiple opt-outs as well. They, their best safety right. or best defender in Savage was out. So, and, and granted, none of those players, objectively speaking, none of those players were to the level of Peyton Wilson. Sure. But the reality is, it is what it is. If NC State wanted to win this game, they had multiple opportunities to do so. You know, that podium doesn't belong to anybody. That podium that end of the game podium, the confetti, doesn't belong to anybody. It never has, nor will it ever. Nor will it ever. Nobody's ever guaranteed it, unless you're talking about the Lions playing in Dallas, but that's a different story for another time. The reality is very simple. You got to get out there and go earn it. Kansas State earned it. We didn't. And then last portion here, the ugly from this Pop-Tarts Bowl. What did you see for that one? You know, I, it's so interesting that your bad kind of went into the absence of Peyton Wilson because this is is definitely what goes into my ugly. The inability to make a tackle. Yeah. How many plays did we see where it's like, oh, man, if our first guy gets him down, we're, we're in good shape. Hell, if our second guy gets him down, we're in good shape. We missed tackles in the backfield. We missed tackles. You know, downfield, it was just missed tackle after missed tackle after missed tackle. And I get it. It's a long layoff. You don't want to go, you know, full tilt, full full go, full throttle tackling um, a ton. But, I, man, that that effort in terms of, of, you know, stopping ball carriers was just so bad at times. You know, you, you got uh, Avery Johnson out there looking like Vanilla Vic. It, it was it was crazy how that went down. Giddens was looking like prime Brandon Jacobs or something. It was just like, oh man, it, we we just keep slipping off him. Is he greased up or something? And, and so that's probably my ugly, the inability to tackle. You know, and the worst part about it, I hate to do this because I never, I never want to make it seem as if somebody is infallible. 
But I said this earlier and I stand by this. The calls that uh, Tony Gibson was dialing up were immaculate. Guys were in the position. Y'all think I'm joking when I say nine sentient Roombas and two football players. I am not. He will get them in position to make the play. It is all about making the play at the moment of truth. And there were too many times we got to the moment of truth and Kansas State guys were just a little bit better. Tackling was certainly one of mine. And, and that goes into K-State's ability to extend a drive. Several plays, we met the running back in the hole or shortly thereafter. And, you know, on a third down or third and, you know, third and medium, maybe a second and long. A big stop there goes a long way in changing the dynamic of this game. And time and time again, Giddens was able to bounce off or slip away. And just every extra yard was an absolute killer in this game. So the tackling was definitely a brutal spot. My other one was the offensive line blocking in the run game. We got virtually nothing outside of Armstrong's creativity on the ground. You know, I didn't exactly expect Kendrick Raphael and Delbert Mims to run all over K-State, but I mean, virtually nothing was provided because they just couldn't get any type of push up front. And we saw issues of that earlier in the season, kind of got cleaned up as the season went along, and it felt like it reverted back in a sense to some of those early season struggles. So that was a tough spot, and it kind of shed some light on our big picture takeaways that we're going to touch on just a second on how all of this will impact the team moving into 2024. This, of course, after a quick word from our sponsors. Last couple minutes of our Tuesday show here, we're going to be talking big picture takeaways just from this bowl game. We're going to do a little bit of a season recap probably later this week, but just for this Pop-Tarts Bowl loss to Kansas State, Kenton, give me your big picture takeaways. I think my big picture takeaways for this uh, for this for this team and for this game is that I don't want anybody looking at the portal saying we're getting too many offensive guys. You saw what I saw. With all due respect, you saw what I saw. And some of those offensive guys are leaving. Delbert Mims is going. Rosner is aging out. The man is 87. He's a family man. He's He's got to go collect Social Security. Best of luck to you, brother. This is a team that has, you know, massive voids to fill at all of these skill positions. Penix is gone. Okay. There are that our tight end room was who who it was tough. As a matter of fact, speaking of who, Juice Vereen and who. So don't don't ask why we got all those tight ends from other places. We need them. We need them. So the, the big picture takeaways uh for me are that and also. Linebacking core, you know, Grace and I talked about this all throughout the year in terms of like we we had to talk about how good Peyton Wilson is all year, but we also kind of gently nudge that what are we going to be when he leaves? What are we going to be as a linebacking core when he leaves? And I'm not going to say that they played a horrible game, but I will say there's some improvement that needs to happen there. Somebody needs to step up because in 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 the three three five in particular, there always has to be at least one guy. Generally, it's a, a a Will or Mike linebacker that's playing off the ball a lot and kind of, you know, figuring out all these things. There has to be somebody uh, that is off the ball more than not that makes it happen. We need that. You know what I mean? And again, if we gave up Peyton Wilson for uh, I, I'm going to say this and I want to be disrespectful. And I, I know I'm taking up too much time. So, Grace, I'm going to talk to you after this. OK, but I remember what we thought about Skalski and Bulware from. Uh, Clemson. Yep. Remember, we were like, there's no better linebacker. There's no way Clemson could get better. And then Jeremiah Trotter Jr. and Barrett Carter came through. If this four-star from Tennessee is that, is if he is that, the 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 Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. to bowl wear Skolski in terms of, of who he is as a Will or Mike linebacker, hey, I ain't mad at you, player. I ain't mad at you at all. We need as much quality depth as we can possibly get because we are entering a world now without Peyton Wilson, without Savion Jackson, without CJ Clark, potentially a, an Aiden White or a Shaheen Battle still kind of waiting to hear how all of that shakes out. We need as much quality depth as we can possibly get. There's not any like humongous takeaways you can take from the bowl game going into 2024 because we're going to look much differently. So that's why I'm going for 
the depth in the portal. We're going to look much differently, so we need to act differently. We need to play differently in 2024. Dave Dorn yeah. talks a lot about being different in his team's beginning of the year. This team next year needs to be the most different we have ever had at NC State based on the, the buzz that's already built up and what you know where they're setting their sights on. They need to be different. They need the pieces to be different. We're going to need a little bit more in the portal in the next week or so, maybe even the spring uh, the spring window when that opens up, but continue being aggressive because we need as much quality depth as you can possibly get. My other big picture takeaway after the game, yeah, it sucked. You want to win that game. You want to win every single game that NC State takes the field. You want to win a bowl game. You want to win a trophy you want to win the cool bowl as the Pop-Tarts Bowl ended up being basically the most watched game outside of the CFP games now. You wanted NC State to be on that spotlight and win that game. And we didn't, and that stung. I'll tell you this. I don't think that that game mattered as much as probably the last five games that we played in the regular season. I put way more stock in those five games than I do in that bowl game. And it took a couple of days to come to that realization. Talk about the opt-outs. We can't exactly just sit here and say, well, if we had Peyton Wilson, because like you mentioned, K-State had still very significant opt-outs of their own. And that's just kind of what bowl season has become. The teams are not complete versions of themselves. And so I don't think you can just be you know, flying off the handle. Dave Dorn will never win a bowl game again. This team is just going to continue to hurt me. It's not that. It's frustrating to lose that game, especially because we were right there in the fourth quarter until we weren't. Take the lessons you can take from this game in that you need to get better on the offensive line, the defensive line, the linebacking core. Actually, you can get better in every facet if we're being if we're keeping it 100 here. You can get better in every facet, and they are making every effort from how it looks so far to do that in 2024. So my advice, or I guess my big my biggest picture takeaway here appreciate the season as a whole i guess away from just that bowl game loss appreciate the season as the whole and get ready for a whole lot more buzz than you've ever seen for 2024 the more i look around this conference with certain announcements that have just been made like dju to fsu cam ward to the nfl there are opportunity uh in the words of dj college sounds like an opportunity That's what it sounds like to me. That'll do it for us here on Tuesday. Again, Happy New Year to all. We're excited to get right back on the saddle here in 2024. Be sure to hit that like button. Drop your comments down in the comment box so I have plenty to choose from for Fan Friday. Tell a friend to tell a friend that you're listening to Locked on Wolfpack in 2024, and they should too. Mash that subscribe button. We will see you all tomorrow on Wednesday. Until then, go Pack. Go Pack.